morning. Welcome. Thanks for joining us as we focus on God's Word. I'm going to pray that today. We will be able to just take in this title. This is a very critical title. The last days according to Jesus Christ. And there's some warnings to us about what happens during these last days. Over the years, there have been attitudes, our attitude during the last days, this idea becomes more and more relevant. People mock us, people think that we are lying about it, about Christ's return, and sometimes people lose faith because they haven't seen this come true. And in Second Peter, it talks about this and how this is going to be common during the last days. And so this is very, very important for us. We're to watch and pray. We're to be prepared. We're to look forward to the future time, for the coming of Jesus. His coming. And that time is drawing near, indeed. Jesus Christ will come again. So then the question becomes, and you know, just recently on September 23rd, there was someone who made a prediction that the end of the world would come and that Christ would return. And before that, what was it, May 21st, a while ago, the world is going to come to an end, Jesus is coming. All these predictions and people, religious people, are saying, predicting the end of the world. But we. The question then becomes, do we know when Jesus Christ will return or when the end of the world will be? And the answer is no. No one knows the exact time, the exact moment. So if a pastor or even if I were to tell you on 2020, 2030, whatever date, if I was able to tell you, I should never be teaching that. That is not okay because no one knows the time for Christ's coming. We know that there w it will happen. But the exact date, no one can know and no one can predict that. And this is a very important key verse for us and a key teaching that we, 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 we read what Jesus Christ said. We're not to make things up, but we see in Mark chapter 13, 23, it says, But of that day and of that hour, no one, no man knoweth. No. No man knoweth. No, not. There's this emphasis, not the angels which are in heaven. And sometimes there are people who are Christians who are making these predictions. And they're like, it's going to happen exactly at this time. It's like, look what God's word says to us in Mark chapter 13, verse 23. And it's like it's not enough for them. Neither the Son, but only the Father that is in heaven. So... No man knows, no angel knows, not even the Son of Man knows. And this is something we really got to keep in mind. No man knows. No angel knows. Not even the Son of Man knows. That's Jesus Christ himself. He did not know the exact time. And so maybe we scratch our heads and we're like, what? But this is critical to our teaching. Even the Son of Man does not know when his return will happen. Exactly. No man knows. This means no individual, no human being on earth, no pastor or any person, no human being knows. No angel knows. So if a person says, an angel told me, no. Even the son of man, he didn't know. And so we're going to keep this in mind while we are studying this. This is a key verse for us to remember in our attitude of the end times. And this is a critical teaching that no one knows when Christ's return will happen. But there was some, an interesting situation. So Jesus went up and he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. And his disciples came to him privately. And they said, Tell us, when shall 
these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming at the end of the world? And then Jesus answers. No one knows, but because his disciples are curious what's going to happen at the end of the world, Jesus explains three things, and we're going to take a look at those here. So Jesus, the disciples asked Jesus three questions. The first question was, when will the temple be destroyed? So this beautiful temple was set up there. And so Jesus tells the followers that the temple will be destroyed, wiped off the face of the earth. And then the disciples were curious, well, what will be the signs of your coming? And so Jesus, ascends into heaven and within 40 years of that time the temple was destroyed. That's a historical fact. And the Jews were spread all throughout the world. And then also they asked, what would be the sign of your coming? They're asking, what is, this, what is it going to be like? What are this going to be the signs of your coming? And then they also ask, what will be the signs of the end of the world? And we are curious about these kinds of things too. And so I encourage each of you to read Matthew chapter 24. It goes on in great detail. Just read through that entire chapter of the Bible. It explains very specifically and very clearly what is going to happen, how the temple would be destroyed, and also the signs of Christ's coming. But once again, we see this emphasis that no one knows the exact time. He is coming. It will happen. There will be terrible things going on in the world. Crises will be happening. But the exact time and when is not mentioned. And it's emphasized that no one knows. So then the question becomes, what should our attitude be concerning the return of Christ? Should we be apathetic? Should we be excited? Should we be ready to listen, ready to take in the news, ready to hear dialogue? You know, should we be aware, like, or should we become apathetic, as it were, and not really caring what's happening in the news? And I've noticed that some Christians, their attitude becomes one of they're not really excited about Christ's return but this is emphasized that we are to be watching and waiting and looking for his return we all are supposed to do that and in 1 Corinthians where it talks about partaking of the Lord's Supper it says that we are doing that and we are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes we are celebrating we are doing this in remembrance of Christ we are looking to Jesus Christ's coming And sometimes Christians just become kind of like, ugh, I don't know, it's not really important, not significant. So then we also notice as Justin was reading, and the specific verses, and you know, sometimes things get changed a little in the verses, but it says here that he, that he said, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. Before, in First Peter, that letter. So now he's saying, I'm sending you another one. I'm sending you another message, you know, and he was sending it to the Roman people at that time in, in Asia that lived in that area. So he said, this is not my second letter to you. And I have written both of them as reminders, as a reminder to tell them again. You know, how, how sometimes you set it up on your phone and you get it clicked so that it's going to remind you of your schedule, your calendar, things that are going on, whether to take a pill, or whether you have an appointment, or whether there's some specific event that's happening, and you look at it, and it's, it's a reminder to you, right? It shows you what you're supposed to be doing, what you've been doing on Sunday, where you're going to go to church, you know, if you, what service that you're going to be doing, you know, on Wednesday nights, it's a morning for me as well, to, to say, and you see that. 
you know, so for all of these, for, for these, these reminders, we set them up to tell us what's going to be happening on our calendar. And we set all of these things up, you know, so that we can, and we can, um, we get reminders of emails and yeah. of things that are happening and, and, you know, for instance, Ricky, Ray, Ray, I'm sorry, probably does these things to remind him to take his medicine at a specific time. So this is, you know, this sign, this reminder, this, this, hey, pay attention here so that we will know. And we see that, you know, sometimes you think, oh, for gosh sakes, stop bothering me. You know, there's, you know, stop it. But you know this reminder thing. It's like we need we need constant reminding to to do this. You know, it's like the Lord is Jesus is saying, "Come on, pay attention. Remember, don't forget this. Don't forget this." Because you know we tend to forget things and and we don't know things all the time. So He reminds us over and over again, and again and again, and it continues on. So the Word is for us. So He says. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you. You know, it's it's like the reminder should be that we become more eager, that we become more motivated. You know, we won't remain in that lukewarm, apathetic state. But you know, when we get that reminder, we should start thinking. We should start looking ahead and be thinking. So, you see, this second letter, he was reminding these people as well. The first missive that he sent, you know, he wrote and but now he's starting again because he's thinking, you know, all of the believers, maybe maybe they're sick of getting these letters, you know. Second time? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. We got another letter. Oh, jeez. You know, but he sent it the first time. He sent it the second time. And then they get it and they're, they get, you know, a second and a third letter sometimes when you get these things, these bills that are whatever. You know, maybe your husband or your wife tells you something that you really need to remember to keep on to. So, like this, in the letter it says, I want you, I want you to recall, I want you to recall these words, to think of these words, don't forget them. The teachings, the explanation, because people do forget. And he had spoken them before, when he had explained them to him. He said, these words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. You know, everything had been put down for the people, for the future. You know, in all of the different books that, of the Bible that had been, put, been put down, all of the different prophets that had written, Joel and all of the different ones, and Isaiah and everything, they had all put these things down. So there was a lot of information for these people that they would have. So he said it was spoken in the past by the holy prophets. And the command given by our Lord and Savior. So all of these teachings were for the future so that people would not forget them as they went on. By way of the apostles teaching them. You know, and giving the warnings to the people all along of what would happen in the future. But you know, now sometimes people just have an attitude of, well, okay, so, you no, know, I don't care. Well, yeah, so I taught that, yeah, I learned that. You look at the world, you see all the things that are going on in the world, and, eh, who cares? Oh, what can you do? So what? But no, a warning for us from the Old Testament it had been given. And then Jesus' teachings as well. He had given us this warning. And they were all for the people in the future. Lots and lots of people, many, many people, they just take their Bible and they toss it in the trash. The Word. Speaking of the last days, and the last days will be terrible. And you know, there are so many different interpretations, and there were so many different things said by the different prophets. There were different, different versions, different translations of it. So it was 
different authors in pre-millennium, mid-tribulation, rapture, post-tribulation, different ones. So many. We see them all over. And, you know, there were struggles in different churches and, and everything. And, and some people say, well, it hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen. You know, the earth is just continuing to go on. But you see this, this interpretation and you see the Bible and people say, oh, it's not, well, I'll just toss it. I don't need this. You know, and these people have, there are going to be a lot of problems in the future. There are going to be a lot of things that, that are just wrenching to our hearts. So it's important that people who believe futuristic, you know, these translations speak of this and they talk of it in, in specificity. And, you know, it's very, very sad that the, the, end, the interpretations of the end times, a lot of Christians, it's sad to say, they just don't even think about it. They just don't even think about Jesus coming back again. You know, and that just breaks my heart. It's just such a terrible thing. You don't believe in what's going to happen in the future? You don't believe that Jesus will come back again? You don't believe in anything? You know, and when they say that, you know, they accept Jesus Christ, well, then that's just false. And there's going to be a lot of trickery that happens in the future as well. So I have a few facts here that I want to, about our attitude, about the last days. You know, we should have a pay attention attitude, meaning not just be distracted by everything, but we should keep our eyes open. We should be looking to the future, to those last days, and what will happen then. We should also believe. We should have an attitude of belief that Jesus will come again, that we can believe. There's no doubt about it. You know, there's no different way with different people that can make this happen. We should not lose faith. We need to keep faith because Jesus has promised he will come again. We should also have an attitude of responsibility, of accountability. You know, to be looking ahead, to be having to be having an attitude of eagerness for this, for what is going to happen. Because, you know, people say, oh, the last days will be terrible, and other people say, oh, it, no, no big deal. That's not really going to happen. You know, but when you read through the Bible, when you read through Second Peter, you can you think about these things. So we know one thing that one thing true that's really key that in the last days, what will we see happening? And the answer is right here. It says the first thing that it says. It says, knowing this first, happening in the end days, it says, this word here, scoffers. Scoffers. You might think, what does that mean? It's, it's a Greek word. Taken from the Greek. It's only used one time in the New Testament. Only once. But it's people who are Mockers are also people who are deceivers, betrayers, people who try to trick you, that lie to you. You know, there was one group amongst the leaders that they had false teachings and they would try to trick the people, to deceive them. And here, the scoffers, mockers, they laugh at these people about what will come in the last days. So we see that. We see them. We see that right now. We see these people doing that. When you look around, and it's happening. Because right now is are the last days. And you see these people laughing at the other people. You know, um, just for example... Noah, when you think of Noah, remember he preached to the people, told them what was going to happen, that there would be a great flood. You know? 
what Nehemiah signed, or Ron signed about that. About the healing rain, you know, about the rains coming down and coming down and coming down. All of these rains. But when Noah was building the ark, he was telling the people, a great rain will come. It will flood the earth, covering the entire world. And then the leaders, what did they do? They scoffed at him. They mocked him. They said, he's making it up. You know. And he was building this enormous ark. In Kentucky, you know, you can go to the museum where you can see you can see a replica of the ark, and you can see how thick the wood was, and you can see how tall it was. It's, it's amazing, amazing concept to, to see that. You know, and he was building it with his family and just kept kept building that ark until it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and people were thinking, what's he doing? And they were mocking him for doing that. They were saying, oh my gosh, what are you doing building that for? Look, there's no rain coming. There's nothing. It's never going to happen. Hasn't happened in all of this time. There had been no rain for quite a long time. For 2,000 years after Adam and Eve, you know, there, there was water came up from the ground, you know, to, to, for the plants and to, to maintain vegetation and after that. But after the flood, then it started to rain. And so people mocked it because they said, we've never seen that. That's not going to happen. But Noah just was patient, and he kept going. And as, and as he was building his ark, he could hear these people laughing at him. You know, they were having their parties, and they were enjoying themselves, and they were looking at him and building his ark. But then what happened? On the last day, the last day, the world will mock, and then... They were there going, where's the rain? No, I don't see any rain. I don't see anything coming down from the sky. And they were laughing at him. Terrible thing. Terrible thing, but that was a warning. And this is a warning as well for us. We will see the scoffers come in the last days. More and more and more. More people. People will say, no, it's not going to. That's not going to happen in the future. You don't have to worry about that. So many of those people. You know, knowing the time. It says, walking according to their own lusts. The lusts of the flesh. Ah, I'm just going to do what I want and enjoy myself. I'm going to enjoy my life on this earth. Think about the last days of the future. Christ coming again. Nah. You know, I've got a good life, I'm going to have a good time, I'm going to have a party, I'm going to get married, you know, and then I'll die. That's all there is to it. The world is full of more and more and more people like that. So there's another part of this verse that I want to emphasize um, in the King James um, 17 and 18. It says, but dear friends... Remember what, in Jude, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. This is in Jude. So they foretold something. The apostles foretold something. They said to you in the last times, there will be scoffers. So a person perhaps sees the hurricane, an earthquake, the fire. They see all these natural disasters happening. But they, they give it no significance. So they see the earthquake happening, the hurricane happening, the fires happening. They're like, oh, there's nothing. There's no prediction of Christ coming. There's no floods. This hurricane. They're a person who doesn't look at that. And they're a false teacher. And they are a scoffer. And it says, there will be scoffers in Jude. They're going to see false teachers. And you're going to know that. And we see that today. It's common. We need to be on the lookout for scoffers. Because there are many false leaders and many false teachers who scoff. 
the coming of Christ and, and do not believe in the last days and do not think it is soon. And the time is soon, it is at hand. And these people will follow their own ungodly desires. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3.3, 3, it actually matches what it says in Jude. It's like a warning. Hey, remember what the apostles said. Remember what Jesus said. He said to watch. He gave us this reminder. And now there's more and more and more things happening. And today, we notice and we can recognize that there are more and more scoffers than ever before. So in Second Peter, there is some emphasis, once again, it says, I'm saying, these scoffers are going to say, where's the promise of his coming? Where is it? We don't see anything. Hey, Jesus hasn't come back yet. Come on. I thought you said he's going to come. And Christians respond, yeah, he's coming soon. And so you'll take a look at the sentence. They say, well, for since... The fathers, our ancestors, they've been saying Jesus is coming. You know, 200 AD, 300 AD, 400, 600, 700 AD, and there's been all these warnings, but they died, they passed away. All of these Christians, all these people who were saying Christ is returning, and all these religious leaders, all of, they all have passed away. And so, for example, maybe a person says, my parents have told me, but they're gone. They've passed away. And now I'm warning you. I say the time is short. And then I, what if I pass away? And so they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is it? Come on. You know, on October 23rd, and then on the 24th, we woke up and... So now people are like, wait, where's the promise of his coming? So people all over have lost faith. And they say, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. They're like, where's the promise of his coming? Peter knew and he's warning us that this is what's going to happen during the end times. So people are uninformed. They don't know. They're stupid, as it were. You know, in, in ASL, we have this sign. It's like, dummy. Ugh. Where's the promise? Where's the promise? Where is it coming? They ask, but they are uninformed. But Jesus Christ has declared it to us. He has spoken to us his word. He has told us. And people oftentimes are stubborn and they're like, where is his promise? Hold on a minute. Consider. Peter's explaining to us how people and what people are going to say and how they're going to argue during this time. And we see this word, don't forget, coming over and over and over again in, in throughout these verses. So he says, don't forget. And then he says, by this, they willfully forget. It's this idea that they had it in their minds, but they tossed it aside. They ignored it. They willfully forget. And now we see many individuals... Like even people who are great teachers, but they are forgetting to teach about the second coming and they're unsure. And I'm like, what? You've been in the ministry, you've been a Christian leader. And they're like, eh, I'm just not really, I don't think really, I don't believe in futuristic things happening. And I don't think it's the popular thing to do. And so some Christians are willfully forgetting.
By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We as human beings change. We do indeed. But God is the same. He never changes. He's infinite, and His Word remains the same forever. God never changes, and He never lies. We lie. We change, but God doesn't. In 2 Peter, verse 6, it says, By which the world that existed perished, being flooded with water. So God made the heavens and the earth, and then there came a point in time when God flooded the entire earth, and he destroyed everything that happened. And then now, things have continued since then. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and sometimes people forget. God flooded the earth as judgment, and sometimes people forget. And God gave the rainbow, and that is a promise that God has given us, that he will never destroy the earth with a flood again. And God has kept his promise. The entire earth has not been destroyed by a flood. But we forget We need to remember that judgment is coming. It will indeed come. We take a look at 2 Peter verses 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of future judgment. So God will be destroying the entire earth with fire. He will. He's reserving it for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Those ungodly men are people who have rebelled against God and continue to live in their sin. They will suffer judgment, those who rebelled against God. They will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And Noah warned the people in his day that the whole earth would be destroyed, and it did happen. So the first judgment was with water, and the second judgment will be with fire. And, you know, perhaps people calculate and think about the days and the times and the years. But we'll take a look here and we'll understand how God views that. It says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. So we think, you know, I'm 20, I'm 40, 50, 60, 70... You know, I feel like, whoa, this is time passing, this is slow. But to God, 1,000 years is as one day. Blink of an eye. Because God is not limited by time, like we are. So we are progressing in our life, and we are warning people, and, you know, we say 2,000 years, but to God, that could be like two days. This is a very, very critical lesson for us. God keeps his promises. God never fails to keep a promise. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack. That idea, slack, is like, ugh, lazy. It's this idea of forgetful or lazy. God is not busy doing other things so that he forgets a promise. God said he would come and he would return. And it's not like, oh, I forgot. I'm 
made an appointment. No, God doesn't do that. God always keeps his promises. As human beings, we're like, God, are you asleep? Keep your promises. And, you know, 20 years ago, there was a um, famous bumper sticker that said, God is dead. That was very popular. There was a, uh, a bumper sticker that said, God is dead. And people are like, I call, I call out to God, but it's, it's, he's asleep. It says he's dead. That is not true. God is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, God does not forget. Even Christians and believers, we're going to forget. We're going to be slack and go on and do our own thing, and we're going to forget about God. We fail God. And so sometimes people ask, well, why hasn't Christ returned? There's a reason. And there's such an amazing point here. We're going to keep reading, and it's going to explain to us why he hasn't returned. But God is long-suffering toward us. God is long-suffering. The reason he delays his return is about to be explained. His return is longer and longer. And the, the disciples... They saw Jesus ascend into heaven. And they said, the time of Jesus is coming is short. Come, let's build churches. Let's get ready. Let's get everything ready. And then the followers passed away. And the next generation rose up. And the next generation. And the next. And the next. And the next. And churches have been established up to this point. And so we have 50 years later. And we have new times. And people are still asking these same kind of questions. People are preaching, where is Christ's return? But this verse, God is long-suffering toward us. He is not willing that any should perish. Suppose Jesus had come to this earth. Then the time for people to repent would be past. So think about your grandchildren, your family members. They are still an opportunity for them to repent before God comes. So we do want God to delay his coming until he has brought in your children, right? So that they would come to the knowledge of Christ. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God desires the repentance of more individuals, and that's why he has not returned. And for him, time is nothing. And for us, it feels like he's waiting and we need to continue to have faith and continue to serve him and continue to look forward to his coming and to invite people to come to Christ. Those who have fallen away and those who are in darkness and in ignorance, we need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them so that they can look and be saved and believe in Jesus Christ. God is patient toward us. He has his reason for having his return be later and in the future. And he has his reasons. And repentance is a very, very important reason. And we'll take a look at another section here real quickly. The idea of repentance means to turn from sin to Christ. It's so simple. Turning from your sin to Christ. This means a person does a 180-degree turn. They are involved in sin and involved in the practices of the world, and they turn around and they turn to Christ. So from sin, they turn to Christ. In the Greek, the word repentance is metinu. It means a change of mind. The turning is a result of a change in heart. It's this idea of the mind and heart changing and becoming focused on God instead of on sin. And repentance is what God desires, and that's why he's delaying his coming, his return. And this is good news. This is great news. We don't just want we, we do want Christ to hurry, but we don't just want we want to think about God. Wow, my grandchildren, they don't know Jesus Christ. I want them to know you. 
I want them to know you before you return. Maybe you could, you know, just stay just a little longer. Yes, at the same time, we do want him to come. We're looking forward and we're anticipating and excited about his coming. But also at the same time, we want to take this opportunity to share the gospel with the world. And Jesus Christ commanded in Matthew chapter 28, Go to all nations, baptizing them, making disciples, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We are to look to Christ. He is coming. I have an example. Suppose you go into the doctor, and the doctor does an examination on me. And the doctor says, let's go ahead and do an uh, MRI. So go in for the MRI. And then the doctor calls me in for the results. And they call me right away and they said, you need to have an emergency meeting with the doctor. So I go. And the doctor sits down. It's kind of, I've uh, got some bad news. you got three months left to live. Or six months left to live. Wow, this means your life is short. Consider if that happened to you. What would you do? What would you think? What, would you, what are your dreams? You know, maybe you want to travel the world. Maybe you want to buy a house. Maybe you want all these things. But now you know you only have 36 months left to live. Imagine a short time left to live. Your attitude would be different, right? Your motivation would be different. The passion might be like, oh, I can just take life as it were. But if you know that your life is coming to an end shortly, you become focused on God, right? On fellowshipping with God. Maybe before you're like, you know, I got plenty of time to pursue God. I'm just going to pursue other things. But never, never ever put God off. He should be the focal point and focus in your life and sharing the gospel with others. Live your life as if you only had a short time, as if you knew your days were numbered, as if you only had two, three months left to live. Share the gospel like you only had a short amount of time left to live. Christ's coming is short. It is obvious that his time for coming is soon at hand. Our friends and family, let us take this opportunity to share the gospel with them, that Jesus Christ has come. Let's witness to them. Let's jump at the chance. Let's cherish the moments that we have that we can share. Let's not waste our time and hours and moments. Because there will come a time when we will go before God. And this is also an interesting verse. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Someone who comes a robber. A thief. This sign, thief. You know, some people do the mask. and You know how they come and they cover their faces. And, you know, these, this picture right here. How, classic picture of how they've got the mask over their eyes so that people won't know. And they come in the night. So he said, the Lord says, it says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night. It's kind of an interesting thing. You know, when they come in, they break in your house, and, you know, they're looking in the curtains, maybe they climb over the fence, and they get into your house while you're sleeping. They sneak around, and they steal all of your stuff, your valuables, jewelry, everything that you've got. They go around and pick up all the, all the good stuff while you're, while you're sleeping, and then they flee. Have you ever experienced having somebody break into your house like that? I have once. But it says, The Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So he's saying, you know, he first he says that he will come as a thief. And we see it up here. In this life, it says Jesus will come like that. Because what is it about a thief? You don't expect him to come, right? It's a surprise to you. You're stunned. 
It happens that quickly. They show up and you're blindsided by the whole thing. You're going along with your life and all of a sudden, it just happens that fast. That fast. You know, you start, you get up in the morning, go to work, pour your coffee, get whatever, and then something happens. You're eating and, you know, anything can happen to you while this is happening, while this is going on. And the Lord could come that way, just that quickly, when you didn't expect it. In Revelation 16, 15, it says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Jesus, it, this is said, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Meaning, living a life that's holy doing what is right, being righteous, obeying the laws of God. It says, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You know, to be naked and have everybody see you is like showing your sins. So that's why we are to be ready to meet the Lord at any time, to keep ourselves pure for him when we first face him. In Matthew 24, 43, it says, but know this, but if the master of the house had known the hour that the thief would come, if he'd had some warning that this thief was coming, he would have been watchful and vigilant. But usually you don't know anything. It just happens to you and then you're, you're just taken aback by the whole thing, the whole experience. But if he had known that the thief was coming, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. So that's the same thing with the coming of Christ. You know, it's going to be a surprise. We don't know when it's going to happen. You know, we don't want to be taken aback by it. We don't want to be saying, oh my gosh, it's happened. Oh, gee. And you're in such fear and you're saying, oh, wait, I'm not ready. I am, I can't, I can't face you just yet. Not yet, really? We need to always be ready. We need to always be prepared. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, it says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So we look at all of these verses, and all of them speak of this thief coming. I mean, we know that one day we will face Christ. We know that we will. And then when Jesus comes, what will happen on earth? Everything will change. So in 2 Peter 3.10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And you see this picture here, that Jesus will come and there will be such a loud noise. And it will be, people think of an atomic bomb was loud and was awful. North Korea. People are concerned about nuclear war, Third World War. People have been afraid of that for many times. And, you know, the leaders of the world, and especially the ones in Korea, they're making all these plans. They're getting ready. It's like they're lighting the fire for, the, for that. You know, and even Trump seems real excited about that. And people are afraid. People are afraid of which side is going to do what. You know, a short time, this could happen. North Korea, you know, they could do a surprise attack where they send one of their rockets off. And then we have to be ready to go to war with them. And it's just a horrible thing to think about a world war again. But every month, you know, we don't know. And the time seems to be getting shorter for this. Terrible, terrible times. And it says, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. For both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Think of the earth burning up in flames. The elements will melt with fire. The earth and all the works in it will be burned up. The entire earth will be on fire when Jesus comes to earth. Because that will be the end of it. That will be the end of the earth. The end of times. Just like the floods when the flood covered the earth and it destroyed everything that was on there. 
Millions and millions of people died because of those floods. Everything. Except for Noah, who was saved in the boat with the eight people in the ark that were with him and the animals that were there. But this time it will be fire that consumes the earth. And everything, the works of the earth will be destroyed. And it will be a horrific thing. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 also says, In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The revenge of the last times, the consumption of the earth and of all the people who have rebelled against God, who have turned away from him and denied him. The punishment will be that the earth will be in flames. You know, we've seen in the papers the terrible fires that are going through Napa and through the valleys over there, and the people are overwhelmed by all of it. The stories that you hear. I know, I was eating at McDonald's, I was eating breakfast one day, and I got the newspaper, and it said, Hell on Earth. That was the headline in the SEC B. Hell on Earth, and I was reading that, and I was thinking, Oh my God, how horrible this is. This is just awful. And I mean, it's frightening. And when Jesus comes, it'll be the same way. The whole earth will be on fire. There will be no escape from this. There will be no getting away. Because it will be his judgment. It will be the destruction of the earth. And one day we will have to face this. And then verse 9 says, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. The fire on the earth on the last days will be a terrible judgment. People who are looking forward and saying the promise of the Lord has come to come back again. Don't forget. God is long suffering. He wants his people to repent. He wants them to come to him. God doesn't want us to perish in fire. You know, people who he doesn't want to say, oh, I'm just going to toss these people in hell and they can stay there forever. God loves his people and he wants us all to be with him. He wants them all to believe in Christ. And it's sad how many denounce the gospel of Christ, who turn away from it, who turn against God. His punishment will be strong and it will consume the earth. All those who rebel against him, who don't obey him. It's their own fault for rejecting God. It's not God's fault. Friends, families, we need to encourage them with the gospel of Christ. Because he will come again in judgment. And it will be a terrible judgment. Now, an important question, the big question in Second Peter... It says, since everything will be destroyed in this terrible way, what kind of people ought you to be? What kind of people should you be? You shouldn't be foolish. You shouldn't be thoughtless. You should follow God, right? Well, we know that, right? We know there'll be judgment. We should not be foolish about it. It says we ought to live holy. Holy. The meaning of this word, the significance of this word, holy. You know, some people say holy. Really? Yes, the word is holy when you face God. When you come into the presence of God, remember, don't play with God. Don't think you can play with God and be a sinner. God knows your heart. And you cannot deceive him. You cannot trick him. You cannot go around him and think, ooh, he's not going to see this. Nobody will look at God looks straight into your heart and knows the thoughts that are in your mind. 
what you should do is say to him, God, I repent of my sins. I am so sorry for the way that I have acted in my life, all the things that I have done. I want to stop that now, and I want to be right with God from now on. Godly lives, a godly walk with him. There's no hiding behind anything. There's no avoiding anything because we will all face judgment with God when the earth is consumed with flames. All those people who rebelled against him and rejected him and denied him. And when that is finished, the promise of heaven, the promise of a new earth, it says as you look forward to the day of God, and speed is coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. You're looking for it, that everything will be destroyed. You know, the earth and all the way that we know it, it will all be burned up and gone. Banished. And then it also says in Revelation 21.1, the heavens and the earth will all pass away. Both of them. Meaning that the things that you save or the things that you keep, nothing will be saved. It will all go. All be gone. Just like that. The earth will be ended. The floods, the earth was saved. But at this time, at the day of judgment, there will be nothing left. There will be nothing saved. And just think of it, the earth will just pass away, be blown away. There will be nothing left. But, this is the good part. When Christ comes back, when Christ returns, in keeping with his promise, because God always keeps his promise, for those who believe in Jesus Christ, we are looking forward to a new heaven, a new heaven, a new earth. The old earth, a new earth will be established and take its place and it will be a home for the righteous. Meaning that the earth will be new with no more sin, no more grief, no more sorrow. In Revelation 21, you can read about it. And you, can, you can see what has been said about it. Our new home will be there. Our new beautiful home. There will be no more judgment. There will be no more fire. And we will enjoy fellowship with, our, with the righteous. So it says, so then, my dear friends, all of my dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, what did he mean by this? Looking forward to what? He was talking about the new heaven and the new earth. You know, to be afraid of the judgment that's coming and to be worried. No. Look forward to Jesus coming. Because we're going to have a new home. All of the people who have not yet believed, they have a right to be afraid. Because they are going to face judgment. And they will face this fiery judgment, this revenge that will come against them. But the rest of us can look forward to a new home. In John it says, do not worry. For I am going to heaven and I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I were not true, I would not have told you, that, but I will gather you up with me, and you will come and have a new home. He says, don't worry, don't be fussed, don't grieve, don't worry about this. There will be a new heaven, and we look forward to Jesus' coming, because he will take us to that new home. All the people who are not yet saved, looking forward they don't look forward to this judgment because they will have the judgment of fire. And this will happen to all of them. 
So it says, make every effort to be found spotless. Don't be apathetic. Don't sit there. Don't think the time, you've got the time. It says, make every effort to be found spotless. You know, it's like you don't want things to touch your clothes, right? You want to be clean all the time. You want to live a good life. So you want to, this is the same way you want to be in front of God. You don't want to let sin come to you in your mind or your eyes or wherever you need to fall to your knees and say, I am a sinner. Lord, forgive me my sins. Forgive me my sins. Cover my sins with your blood. Don't put it off. Don't think that you can do it later. Take the opportunity now to do it. Because it's right there waiting for you. Don't wait till a different day. Because it says, you need to be found spotless and blameless. Meaning, having done no wrong, and at peace with Him, at peace with God. You know, everything that goes on in your life, it should draw you closer to God, so that you have no fear, so that you can be with Him. And I encourage all of you to have this attitude. I mean, this attitude is, is the one that we should have. This is the significant and most important one. In Matthew 24, chapter uh, verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered them and said to them, Take heed, pay attention, that no man deceive you. Again in Matthew it says, for false Christs and false prophets, many of them, there will be so many, they will rise to trick you and to betray you. It says, to deceive if possible, even the elect. So that we fall again into sin. So that we do not have this relationship. So that we are separate from God. So it says that the devil, that even the devil can, will flee from us. So I, I have a short conclusion, you know, something to encourage us and to, to speak to our attitude. But we may have an attitude of motivation, of looking forward to this. It's important that we need to seriously understand of what Jesus is saying to us, how he's warning us, how he's saying, beware of the scoffers. Beware of those people who will mock you. Beware of the deceivers. Be on the lookout for them. Because their number is increasing. You know, when, when you see the earthquakes and you see the tornadoes and they say it's nothing, that's because that they are false people. And then it says here, this word, take heed. Really important. It means pay attention. It's watch. It's from Mark 13, verse 33. It says, take heed. Watch and pray for you do not know when the time is. We don't know. So we need to stay focused on God. And again, this, these words, take heed, mean, really, keep your eyes open. Don't have tunnel vision. Don't be focused on just yourself or whatever. You know how they're... <laughs> There are some birds and like owls and things that lizards and stuff how they can look around and they can see around all the time. But we need to be, you know, not focused on one thing, but we really need to keep our eyes open and be looking and know. You know, three hundred and sixty degree vision is really what we need to have as we perceive through life because it's sad that many Christians are just so focused in on one little thing. You know, or sleep. You know, it's like they, they're just like looking at one thing. But we have to keep our eyes open for the things of the world. The things that we see because they're going to be false leaders, and false prophets, and mockers, and scoffers that we need to keep our eyes on. So let us stand and pray. You know, all of the.